We are recording. The chair notes the time is six o'clock. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with the roll call of the ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows. Here. Mr. Everell Henry. Here. Mr. Philip White. Here. Mr. David Sloviter. Here. The quorum is present. Also attending the public hearing tonight is Ms. Cream Bre Ms. Christine Brestrup, Town Planner and Director, Nate Malloy, Senior Planner, and Jacinta Williams Planner and uh, with the town. We also have Carolyn Murray of KP Law to assist us with guidance uh, on legal matters. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The, board, the Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Law, Chapter 40A, and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff, and they may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will ask, for quest will ask questions for clarification or to gather additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen or by pressing star nine on their phone. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where the information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by a public meeting for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for the special permit, the board has 90 days from close of hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20 day appeal period for an agreed party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body and superior court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the registry of deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, a public hearing on ZBA FY 2025-04 Wayfinders Inc. requests a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40B to construct a 31 unit mixed income rental housing in a three-story development with 14 proposed parking spots on the premises of 31 Southeast Street, map 15A, parcel 20, in the RVC, Village Center Residence Zoning Districts, and a 47-unit mixed-income rental housing in a three-story building with 46 proposed parking spots on the premises of 70 Belcher Town Road, map parcel 15C58, 15C59, 15C60 in the RN and FPC Neighborhood Residence and Flood Prone Conservancy Zoning Districts. After that, there will be a general public comment period, uh, time for other business not anticipated within 48 hours, and adjournment. The first order of business tonight is a public hearing on ZBA 2025 04 Wayfinders, requesting a comprehensive permit under Chapter 40B. We have not yet conducted a site visit, but we hope to do so by September, on September 10th. We can talk more about scheduling for that uh, at the in new business at the end of the meeting. 
Also, the town has re received the following submissions from the applicant. And it's huge, and I'm going to generally describe the submissions that have been given to the town that I'm in, that I'm in possession of. We've received the town applicant, the forms and fees required by the town. We've received project information, which includes the project summary, application information, information about the development team, um, existing site plans, which can include descriptions, zoning, adjacent properties, and infrastructure and utilities, proposed development narratives, including sustainability, building design, parking, accessibility, a traffic impact statement, scale, placement on site and landscaping, density, proposed housing and affordability details, and tabulations of proposed buildings. We've received a management plan narrative, which talks about wayfinders management, their staffing, trash and recycling, parking, lighting, signage, landscape maintenance, snow removal, on-site recreational facilities, indoor HVAC equipment, material equipment and large households, goods storage. We've received the, there's the Amherst, Board, they returned to us the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals criteria and responses, community outreach efforts, including uh, local support and community support and comments and responses from uh, abutters, list of waivers they requested, filings to other boards, project eligibility, and a list of exhibits. I have not seen any public comments that have been uh, listed in the town um, uh, website, and so I'm unaware of anything that has any public comments since this, mo uh, this project has been noticed. Here's what I hope we accomplish tonight. Uh, introductions, board disclosures, safe harbor, uh, we want to invoke our safe harbor, an introductory presentation by town staff on the project, an introductory presentation by, on both sides by Wayfinders, a, dis a discussion of peer review and how we may use it, presentation for Belchertown Road, which includes site design, landscape, lighting, and parking. And if we have enough time, and I hope we do, we do the same thing for the East Street site as well. Site design, landscaping, lighting, and parking. And then we will, of course, reserve time for public comment. We have reserved time in the future meetings to consider Wayfinders comprehensive permit applications. Each of those meetings will have a specific topic for discussion. We're going to be seeing a lot of each other. And so each of the ZBA members and panels for this hearing has been identified through the roll call. I've identified our town staff and our outside council. So I thought it would make sense for those of you who are working for Wayfinders and who are likely to be presenting to the board tonight to please introduce you introduce and identify yourself uh, for the record. So I guess start out with um, you guys choose who you want to start with and let's just go through the Wayfinders pre presenters, please. Can someone let Mr. Gruber in? James Gruber is in the attendees, but he's he is running the show for uh, Wayfinders. All right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's several people. One of our architects is uh, waiting. Uh, an attorney, yeah. Can I also just make the request that people change their names um, to reflect who they are? Because there was someone else who had the name James Gruber. And so I thought, yeah, he was already in. But... Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, hey, so Gruber, please you... rename yourself. And I'm still looking for Ellen. Um, she's the attorney. She up uh, here. She she's is. here. Okay, yeah. great. Okay. And okay, may I know everybody. one other thing, Mr. Chair? Yes. I think that the introduction that you gave listed a timeline that's related to special permits. Yes. And <clears throat> I think um, Ms. Murray may be able to give us a timeline that's related to comprehensive permits, whether she would like to do that this evening or another night. I think that would be helpful. but. We don't want people to be confused about following one line of uh, one timeline versus another timeline. Thank you. Yeah, I've got a timeline later after the introductions. Okay. Yeah. If it's okay for us to begin our introductions, um, yeah, I'll just, begin the Wayfinders. Yeah, just your name and address and just who you are, your role in the, in the yep. some other business we have to take care of before you do your presentation. No, I know. Uh, my name is Bruce Ehrlich. I'm the senior vice president for real estate development at Wayfinders. Um, and I will turn this over to Jamie Gruber, 
who is the project manager who's directly responsible for the project. Jamie? Well, uh, thank you very much. I am Jamie Gruber, a project manager uh, with Wayfinders um, that's located in Springfield, Massachusetts, uh, representing um, them as the developer. And uh, here with us tonight, um, we have our attorney, Ellen Ryman. I'll pass it to her to introduce herself. Oh, you're you're muted, Ms. Ryman. Thank you. Sorry. Um, Ellen Fryman uh, with Shot Schwartz and Fenton, and my address is 1441 Main Street, Springfield, and um, legal counsel for Wayfinders in this project. Great. Thank you. Turn it over to maybe Coleman. Yeah. Hi, I'm Coleman Horsley. I'm a senior project engineer at Niche Engineering, and I'm the civil engineer for the project. And you live where, Mr. Holt Horsley? Uh, I live at uh, 524 Putnam Ave in Cambridge, Mass. Got it. Who's next, Mr. Josh? Yeah, I'll introduce myself as well, although Coleman will be handling the bulk of the presentation. My name is Joshua Soares, project manager with Niche Engineering, the project's civil engineer, and I'm located at 12 Morley Road in Quincy, Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Soares. Pass it off to Bob. I'm Bob Wegener, principal at the Narrow Gate uh, Architects. I live at 27 Shore Avenue, also in Quincy. I believe my colleague, Andrew Benson, uh, is having a hard time getting in. He might be in the waiting room. Uh, while we'll, while we'll, we're trying to do that, I'll pass it along to DJ. Thanks, Bob. Um, I'm DJ Shagnon. Uh, I live at 82 Benton Road in Somerville, Massachusetts. I'm a principal at CBA Landscape Architects, who are the landscape architects for the project. Um, and I'll note for the record that my one of my co-principals, Kayla Bachman Chavez, is actually the principal in charge for the project, but she was unavailable tonight. So I'm covering this meeting. You'll see much more of her in the future. But I've been working with her alongside her a little bit on the project through its course. So I'm familiar with it. Great. And I think the last person we need to I think Andrew is in now. Is is it here, Mr. Engstrom? Andrew, you want to introduce yourself and where you live? I don't know if he's muted or if he is. I'm not sure. We, we, we may have lost him there. Well, we will come back to him um, when you do your presentations. All right. Thank I think everybody's been introduced. The next order of business is see if there's any disclosures from any board members. Any board members wish to make a disclosure? If not, okay. So for the benefit of the public, I want to give a little background on the 40B process that the board will be operating under for this comprehensive permit. 40B enables the developers to obtain a single permit for residential development. So instead of having to obtain approval from several town boards, the ZBA acts as a one-stop shop on all local issues in the place of other town bodies. We act on all local issues but we do not act on matters of state law. So there may be some local bodies that are administering state law, such as wetland protections and some other conservation issues that will act within their own jurisdiction. The ZBA decision to approve or deny a comprehensive permit must be consistent with local needs. If a town meets certain criteria, the decision is presumed to meet local needs and the decision of the ZBA is not appealable. In effect, the town has a safe harbor from the appeal of, this, of its decisions. In the case of Amherst, we meet one of the criteria for the safe harbor by having more than 10% of our housing stock in the subsidized housing index. In fact, 11.74% of the housing stock in Amherst qualifies for inclusion in the subsidized housing index. While 40B gives the town protection from litigation resulting from our decision on this matter, it also obligates the town to complete its work in a timely manner. We have to invoke our assertion of safe harbor at the beginning of the process. We have 180 days from the date of the first hearing to complete our hearings, and we must decide the comprehensive permit within 40 days of the close of the public hearing on the matter. In addition, this process requires a vote of three of the five members for approval, rather than votes of four of the five members that you approve for a special permit. The first order of business I wish to accomplish tonight is to invoke the safe harbor. And I have a motion which is complicated, so I'm going to state it myself. 
I move that the board determine that the town of Amherst has achieved one of the statutory minimum standards set forth under General Laws, Chapter 40B, Sections 20 to 23, and 760 CMR 56.033, because of the town's subsidized housing inventory, as maintained by the Executive Office of the Town and Livable Communities, formerly the Department of Housing and Community Development exceeds 10% of the town's total housing units on the date that the application for a comprehensive permit was received from Wayfinders Inc. with the property located at 31 Southeast Street and 70 Belchertown Road, Amherst, Massachusetts, the application. Notwithstanding that the board has achieved the safe harbor, the board elects to proceed with the full local hearing, with the board having the right to deny the application or to grant the application with conditions and with a finding that the board's denial or grant of the application would be consistent with local needs. Finally, the board authorizes the chair to finalize and execute and send written notice to the applicant with a copy to the EOHLC, that is the <laughs> Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities, to invoke the 10% subsidized housing index statutory minima within 15 days of the opening of the August 29th 2024 public hearing on the application. Is there a second to that motion? I, I saw a second. <laughs> second. All right. Is there any discussion or questions about that motion from members of the board? If there is not, the vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Sloviter. Aye. The vote is five nothing. The motion carries. The next order of business is a staff presentation on the project. And uh, Ms. Brestrup or Mr. Malloy, I'm not sure who's going to, to make the presentation, but the floor is yours. Sure. Hi, I'm Nate Malloy. I'll uh, provide another introduction to this project. Uh, there's no slides to share or anything. You know, essentially, the town uh, is a partner with Wayfinders. You know, the, the genesis of this started, oh, you know, seven years ago or longer. And so, you know, we're, we're really excited to have, have a developer to, you know, bring to fruition affordable housing on both these sites. Uh, beginning in the 2000 teens, the Housing Trust looked at the East Street site for affordable housing. Uh, there were concept studies, there were outreach meetings, there was discussions about what could happen on that property, and it was prioritized for housing. Uh, and the town went through the process to you know, dispose of it and have that property be ready for housing. Uh, and then the Belchertown Road site came up and it was a, a really great opportunity. It is so close to East Street School. We've talked about improvements to the East uh, Amherst Village Center and the town acquired that property solely for affordable housing. So you know, it was purchased for the purpose of housing, not for recreation or conservation. Uh, you know, and then um, you know, in the interim, there's other ideas about what could happen in East Amherst. And so, you know, the town is working on Route 9 right now. We have block grant money and CPA money to fix the road in front of the East Street School site. We've worked on the Fort River Farm behind the site on Belchertown Road for conservation purposes. Uh, you know, and it's really close to the new Fort River School. And so we really see this as a lot of opportunities in the East Amherst Village Center. The town went through a competitive process to select wayfinders. We put out a request for proposal with a lot of requirements in terms of affordable housing, site amenities, trying to balance you know, some open space on the East Street site uh, with the number of units, um, amenities, and what could happen in terms of income levels. And wayfinders was chosen with a selection committee uh, based on their concept plans and their narrative and, and their response to the proposal. And so you know, that was put out publicly. The town had a few responses and it went through a pretty rigorous process, a comparative review and Wayfinders was selected. And so uh, in the last two years, Wayfinders has refined their program and their designs for this site. Uh, and so we're really excited about that. So they've been to other boards before their comprehensive permit was finalized with the ZBA. They've been to the planning board. There's been public meetings. They've been to the historical commission all to get feedback for this project. And so you know, what you see before you is not necessarily the first draft. It may not be the final, but it's something that has been worked on uh, with the town, with staff, with other boards and committees to arrive at what we think is a really nice plan for both sites. And it's balancing, like I said, the need for housing, 
for amenities on the site. Both sites have wetlands and land use constraints for parking. And so they've really packed into both these sites what we asked in our, it actually exceeded what we put in our request for proposal. Not only the design, but also what they will do in terms of management, in terms of tenant selection, in terms of affordability. And so we're really pleased to have this project in East Amherst. Uh, and you know, like I said, the town uh, is, a, is a project sponsor. Uh, so we, the town will continue to own the land. It'll be a 99 year lease. So we'll still be the owner. We'll have no, um, you know, no management or any obligations there. We are maintaining the back portion of the East Street School site for public use. So there's a, there'll be an easement there. So you know that was a really important piece. Uh, and the town's also contributed uh, about $3 million in funding for this project uh, with the purchase of Belchertown Road and uh, CPA and ARPA money that totals about 2 million. And we've provided almost a million dollars in block grant funding for infrastructure, infrastructure improvements on Belchertown Road and East Street to help support these projects in terms of you know road paving, bike lanes, we're gonna do water and sewer connections. And so we're really invested in these sites. And you know, for instance, if it wasn't Wayfinders, it'd be someone else. And if it wasn't now, it's gonna be sometime else. I mean, the goal of these two properties is affordable housing. And the timeline, the horizon for this is, unfortunately it'll be 12 years before someone might actually occupy a unit. So we've been planning for this, you know, for seven years or longer. And if this receives permitting and goes through financing, it could be another five or six years before occupancy. It's just the, the timeline for these is so great that, you know, it's really exciting when it finally gets the permitting. So, you know, with that, I'll also say, you know, the town is always looking at other affordable housing projects. And so it seems like every other year we have a comprehensive permit project and we're feeling comfortable about that. You know, we see it as a really nice mechanism to allow the developer flexibility with local permitting to get affordable units. There are some other ways to do it, but for Amherst, we feel like we work closely with the community, with the zoning board, with our developers to get a nice comprehensive permit project. In other parts of the state, it may not seem that way, right? You might have heard negative things about a comprehensive permit, but we actually view it as a really nice tool to use to help get affordable housing. And so, uh, you know, there could be other regulatory pieces or other things, but we really like the 40B process. And like I said, we also put funding in in town uh, and staff support for it. So um, I think that's it for now. If there's any questions, uh, you could ask them. Um, I could keep talking, but <laughs> I'll stop. I think that's a really good introduction, Mr. Malloy. Um, does any book, Mr. Henry? I just have one question, um, just so I, I fully understand. Um, what's the rationale behind renting versus owning? Yeah, so on other properties the town's done housing with, we we uh, enter into a 99-year ground lease. And some of it is uh, in terms of uh, for some, some kind of site control. And then there's some instances where outright ownership by the developer might um, be a little different in terms of uh, our process of how we have to dispose of property and then what actually happens with it. So sometimes a ground lease is actually a bit easier than an outright sale to a developer. Uh, I mean, I, you know, if, you know, it could be one or the other, but we've used ground leases pretty effectively for the last few comprehensive permits that have been on town property. Thank you. Any other questions for our staff? If not, um, get a, a short introduction from Wayfinders, just the overall um, impression or your overall presentation of the project. And then we're gonna, of course, be going into more details later on, but give us your overview, please. Okay, great. Can you all hear me? Yep. Okay, perfect. And um, the um, I'll just run through the entire uh, the slide deck and then um, with questions um, that come up um, at the end, or did you want me to stop and pause at any? any? Well, is, is this your, this, this is the introduction or presentation, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. So I think you should go through it and then we can have questions at the end. I think when we get into more detail, we probably break it down by topic and people could ask questions at the end of a presentation on a specific topic. But since this is the introduction, let's have you go through it 
and board members can write down their questions and, uh, that they have and then ask them after, when you're finished. Great, thank you very much. All right. Hello and good evening. My name is Jamie Gruber and I'm a project manager in the real estate development department at Wayfinders. I'd like to start out by thanking the town staff and members of the board for scheduling the hearing this evening for our comprehensive permit application and for all your time in advance as we discuss the proposed developments of 31 Southeast Street and 70 Belcher Town Road. Here with us tonight is our attorney, Ellen Fryman from Chat Schwartz and Fenton, along with members of our design team. Wayfinders is the largest not nonprofit housing provider serving Western Massachusetts for over 50 years. And our organization provides services in the housing arena from homelessness through home ownership. Wayfinders is a developer, a property manager, as well as a provider of housing related services to the broader community. Because we develop properties with a commitment to owning and managing them long term, we're invested in working with the communities that surround each site. In terms of how, in terms of those who don't live in our properties, our housing centers in Springfield, Holyoke, and Northampton provide access to a wide variety of programs, including emergency rental assistance, first-time home buyer education, and employment support services. Wayfinders has completed over 60 rental development projects, creating over 1,300 units and currently owns and manages over 800 rental units in Western Massachusetts across multiple sites, primarily up and down the I-91 corridor. Here are a few of our developments that include Butternut Farm and Olympia Oaks in Amherst. In Northampton, we have Live 155 in the Lumber Yard on Pleasant Street, along with Sargent House on Bridge Street. And Library Commons is one of our recent Holyoke developments as well. Wayfinders will serve as a developer and project sponsor and will manage the project once completed. The development team includes our attorney, Ellen Fryman from Trash Swartz and Fenton with experience in both affordable housing and 40B permits, the Narrow Gate Architecture, a mission-driven firm focused on affordable and supportive housing, niche engineers as our civil engineer, CBA landscape architects, O'Reilly Talbot and Oaken, OTO as our environmental and geotechnical engineers, NEI General Contracting as our pre-construction manager and Airtight Energy Consulting, providing sustainability and passive house consulting services. This development, as Nate said, this, this summarizes uh, a lot of what kind of Nate said. This development has been years in the making with a significant investment by the town of Amherst and Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, including providing the town land, town funds, and town staff time, all working collaboratively towards the goal to create more affordable housing. Uh, the Community Preservation Act funds were used to determine the feasibility of affordable housing at the former East Street School site. And in the spring of 2019, the Amherst Town Council voted to authorize the town manager to convey the property for affordable and mixed income housing purposes. In Belcher Town Road, in the spring of 2021, um, the, it, it it was purchased for um, housing purposes uh, with CPA and affordable housing trust funds as well. In the fall of 2021, the town issued the request for proposals and Wayfinders responded and was selected as the pr preferred developer. And as Nate also mentioned, the town has supported development providing additional CPA and ARPA contributions of a million dollars, all the land, undertaking the roadway and infrastructure improvements on Belcher Town Road. And they are also planning to undertake an ecological restoration project to repair culverts at the 31 Southeast Street site. That'll include a stream channel and wetland restoration. And we're extremely grateful for the robust town support we have received this far and excited to be part of this development. Once Wayfinders was selected as the preferred developer, the land development agreement was entered into with the town, giving us site control as we work through the pre-development phase. At the financial closing, the town will enter into a 99-year ground lease of the properties. The development will be funded by leveraging over $30 million in federal, state, and local sources, primarily through low-income housing tax credits. We've completed phase 
phase one environmental site assessments, hazardous material surveys, wetland and resource area delineations, soil and geotechnical engineering studies, notification to the Mass Historic Commission, completed property boundary surveys and title work, as well as traffic studies. The design work has progressed far beyond the conceptual stage to arrive at the current design while engaging the town and the community. We had multiple meetings with town staff and had meetings with the town department heads, including the fire department, engineering department, building department, conservation agent, and planning staff. Additionally, we presented to the Amherst Historic Commission, the planning board, Amherst Municipal Affordable Housing Trust, and reached out to neighbors and abutters and held information sessions, allowing us to take feedback and recommendations into account as we progress the design. The most notable comments we received allowed us to make significant changes to the aesthetics of Belchertown Road ahead of our comprehensive permit application. The, as I mentioned, the development is two sites, 31 Southeast Street and 70 Belchertown Road. They are both located in the East Village Center with restaurants, convenience stores, and coffee shops, along with other businesses and services. It is. It is also just a short walk to downtown Amherst where there are many amenities and services. Each site is conveniently located adjacent to a PVTA bus stop. The Route 30 bus provides regular daily service between Old Belcher Town Road Puffton, and Puffton Village via the Amherst Downtown Common and UMass Campus. There is also a, vi a Valley Bike Share Hub at the intersection of College Street and Belcher Town Road, just a few minute walk from each site. As noted earlier, the construction along Belcher Town Road includes the installation of a new crosswalk in front of the proposed development. This will create a direct path to the bus stop in Colonial Village, further increasing the walkability of the area. Here is the PVTA bus route showing the stop locations near the development. As the East Street is located within the residential district RC, uh, DC Village Center Residence uh, Zoning District. The immediate neighboring neighborhood includes both single family and multifamily homes that are owner occupied and tenant occupied. The neighborhood also features a variety of other property uses, such as religious organization and several small commercial office buildings that provide local business services. The Fort River Elementary School is also nearby. <clears throat> 70 Belcher Town Road is located within the residential district RN neighborhood residence, and the portion of the site that will remain undeveloped is located within the resource protection district uh, flood prone conservancy zone. This site is surrounded by a mix of single and multifamily residences, including colonial vill village apartments, and also has many amenities nearby, such as a bank, auto repair shop, convenience store, and gas station. There's an aerial view of the area of the area. Here's a couple existing site photos of uh, 31 Southeast Street, the school, and Belcher Town Road. Uh, the current site has two vacant single family homes that will be demolished as part of the redevelopment. One was built in the 1990s and the other was built around the 1930s based on the assessor's information. The plans have incorporated many features that provide much needed affordable housing while minimizing the effects on the environment and surrounding community. In order to maximize the housing provided, we look to most efficiently use the build to build area at each site. And our plans include buildings that will provide barrier free housing and elevator access to all floors and units. The buildings will be designed and built with sustainability as a core goal and will incorporate energy efficiency measures consistent with passive house and enterprise green communities. The building will be all electric and will seek to install solar PV arrays for on-site renewable energies and our development will have on-site property management allowing for a meaningful presence. Southeast Street School will create 31 units with a mix of units ranging from studios to three bedrooms. Um, the site will include the adaptive reuse of the existing school into six new apartments, a common laundry room, and indoor bike storage. The new construction addition will create 25 units and include the on-site office and community room for residents. The Southeast Street parking and drive will remain in a similar location as the existing parking area, and the new construction addition will be a sited along the road. 
The Belcher Town Road site will be entirely new construction. The three-story building will create 47 units with a mix ranging from studios to three bedrooms. This will also have an elevator and provide indoor bike storage, laundry room, and community room for residents in addition to the management office. The Belcher Town Road building will be sited along a road with parking and resident patio in the rear of the building. Uh, income restrictions and affordable housing are all based upon area median income levels or AMI. And these may be familiar to you, but here are a few of the examples of income limits for various household sizes. The income limits are updated by HUD each year and vary depending on geographic location. These are the limits for the Springfield HUD metro area that includes Amherst. So currently, the area median income for a family of four in our region the, at a 60% AMI is around 65,700. 65, and here are some examples of preliminary rents for, for the, the same four person household at a 60% AMI with an annual income of 65,000. 65, 700,000, I'm sorry, $65,700,000 could expect to pay $1,700 or $1,707 a month, including utilities for a three bedroom unit. All rents will include utilities, electricity, heat, and air conditioning and hot water. And utilities are included in rents in all rental um, income levels. And light tech rents are updated each year and are subject to change, but this is generally well where they'll be. The apartment income mix across both sites is shown above. Some of these numbers may change, but this is generally where they'll fall. 23 of the units will be for families and individuals with 30% of the area median income or less. Seven of the units will be for families and individuals with 50% of the area median income or less. 19 of the units will be for families or individuals with 60% of the AMI or less. And 19 of the units will be for families or individuals with incomes up to 80% AMI. Approximately 68 of the 78 units will be income restricted units while the remaining 10 will be reserved for market rate. The apartment income mix at 31 Southeast Street We'll have 10 market rate units with the remaining 21 units split across the affordability levels shown here. And then Belcher Town Road, the land holds an affordability requirement that was imposed during the town's acquisition process. So all the units are proposed to be at 80% AMI or below and will be considered affordable. Here's a schedule of our development. We are in the permitting phase. It started when we submitted our project eligibility application to the Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities, or EOHLC, in early February of this year. As part of this project eligibility phase, the town hosted a website that included plans and documents for review and a public comment board. During this phase, we presented to the Planning Board and Historical Commission, as well as hosted an independent online information session we're able to incorporate feedback into our current design. The Executive Office of Housing and Livable Communities issued their project eligibility letter in June. And according to that letter, the proposed um, project appears generally eligible under the requirements of the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program. The proposed housing is designed for, and is appropriate for the sites and the proposed project appears financially feasible within the context of the housing of the Amherst housing market. We anticipate the permitting will run through the fall and wrap up in early winter and be fully permitted prior to our submission to this year's state funding round that typically occurs in January or February. Due to the competitive funding round process, we expect the financing to be com complete, leading the development into construction in 2027. From there, we'd expect an 18 month construction period wrapping up and bully, being fully leased in 2028 and managed by our property management division. 
Wayfinders professionally manages over 800 affordable rental home units in, com in communities across Western Mass and, and one in Central Mass. We have a culturally diverse portfolio of properties that, it, that addresses the needs of specific demographics like older adults, low-income families, and people with disabilities. We offer a range of apartment options from single room occupancy to four bedroom apartments. Our property management and residential services team will work closely to create a positive and productive relationships with our, with our residents. The result of this collect Collaboration is genuine sense of community through social activities, workshops, meetings, and services. Wayfinders will have a part-time on-site property manager, maintenance personnel, and resident service coordinator. Emergencies will be responded to by maintenance personnel and residents will be able to contact maintenance after posted hours through a 24-hour, seven-day answering service to be established by, during the management process. Trash and single stream recycling will be provided at each site via two dumpsters that will be emptied weekly or bi-weekly by our waste hauler and our landscaping and snow removal and other small maintenance items will be provided by independent contractors overseen by the staff. The sites will be permitted concurrently with the Conservation Commission due to wetland resource areas on each site We'll work with both the commission and the ZBA throughout the permitting process. The town zoning does not currently allow for the proposed density of the apartment buildings, so a comprehensive permit is sought, including waivers to allow for the development as designed. Our attorney, Ellen Freiman from Chat Shorts and Fenton, will now discuss the waivers. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. Um, good evening again. Uh, so as you know, one of the features of uh, obtaining a comp permit is the ability for the developer to request waivers from certain requirements from the town's bylaws, permits, and approvals. Um, and we have requested as part of our application, uh, the minimal waivers, which address several categories of the town's laws, rules, and regulations. These are um, relating to use, uh, dimensional requirements, the zoning bylaw generally, the local wetlands bylaw, the town ordinance, and that includes the residential rental property bylaw. The list submitted with the application is an initial list because this is a dynamic process. As we go through the various aspects of the project over various hearings, we will modify, add, and drop uh, waivers. And we will go over each of the waivers in detail when the ZBA reviews the applicable aspect of the project. And then the ZBA will formally adopt the final list uh, as part of the comp permit decision. Great, thank you, Ellen. Now I'd like thank to you. pass. Now I'd like to pass this off to our design team. Um, Bob, are you going to lead this off? Yes, that'll be me. Thanks, Jamie. I'll share my screen and uh, we're just going to focus on uh, Belchertown Road for now. And I will uh, also uh, say that, uh, let me get that up. So Mr. Wagner, so is, yeah. this, is this the second part of, the, of your presentation where you were doing the presentation on Belchertown Road, site design, landscaping, lighting, et cetera? That's correct. Yeah, so let's, let's stop and see if anybody has uh, any questions from the introductory part. And then I wanna have a, a quick discussion about um, peer review with the board, and then we'll go into the presentation for Belchertown Road, okay? Sounds good. Yep, so does anybody have, any board members have a question for the applicant um, that comes from the, the introductory piece that they just gave us, the presentation? Mr. White. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, something I noticed, and I may be looking at a different definition here. Oh, sorry, my video is off. Um, but at one point it was referenced that the project will be passive housing um, as far as energy usage. Uh, but then further on in the slideshow, uh, we were told that the project would feature both 
heating and air conditioning which I, as far as my experience, isn't generally a part of a passive project. Am I incorrect in that? Hope I am, but. I could try to speak to that. Um, uh, there, there may be some confusion with terminology, but uh, Passive House is a, is a rating system. Um, uh, it's international, but the, the U.S. Passive House is referred to as FIAS, and that has to do with with energy efficient efficiency and uh, um, tightness of the building envelope so that uh, heating and cooling loads are driven way down. Um, so it's not passive in the sense that you can open windows to allow for natural ventilation, although that's a good thing and we we will do that. But the the, the rating system that uh, we're using is, is referred to, to passive house. I don't know if that helps. All right, um, Mr. Meadows. No, oh, you're muted, Craig. I, I thought I'd bring it up early on. I didn't notice that there's any EV parking that you've indicated. And I believe probably since you started the process that the state has uh, brought in new regulations. So you, you do need EV parking. Um, and if you could just des designate where they will be and how many, that would be appreciated when you get farther along. We will be showing that uh, when we move into the, uh, the the site lighting plans, the EV charging stations are shown in that plan. So I'll be happy to point those out when we get there. Thank you. Any other questions from board members for uh, wayfinders? All right. Um, Ms. Breshtrup or uh, Mr. Malloy, who's going to just give us a brief uh, introduction summary of uh, peer reviews. The reason I want to do it now is that we're going to be looking at very specific items, technical items. That's typically what you use peer review for. We may or may not need to have peer review, but um, when we get to the specifics of stormwater, lighting, traffic, et cetera, sometimes, often, um, peer reviews will be asked. Um, and we may or may not need them in this case, but uh, Mr. Malloy or Ms. Breastbrook, can you um, just talk through that process for us? Yeah, sure. Steve just did really. Uh, no, I think that, you know, right there are the topics that Steve mentioned, you know, it's usually a technical review of what's been submitted, uh, you know, and so the board may not know tonight if you would, if you would need peer review, but it's something usually we'd want to determine early on in the hearing process, because we would have to go through, you know, a public procurement to find a consultant that's agreeable to the applicant in the town to then review, you know, the area of expertise they're in, whether it's, you know, traffic or stormwater. And so, uh, you know, if a project seems like it's impactful enough or there's questions about what could happen in terms of some of the, the design, then a peer, peer review may be necessary. And so you could have peer review from anything from the architecture and scale to stormwater to parking, uh, even maybe uh, financial, although I'm not sure that's necessary here. And so, you know, throughout the process, if there's these questions, uh, it could be clarified now whether or not we we would we would need someone outside of town staff or um, our attorney or the applicant's team to help answer questions. Uh, and so, I will say that you know, in terms of traffic, they uh, the applicant is working on supplemental information for parking uh, in the East Amherst Village Center. The town has done uh, two traffic studies. Uh, both for the, the Fort River School, the new Fort River School. So there's ongoing work to study traffic and traffic patterns on Route 9 and, you know, East Street generally, Northeast Street and Southeast Street. And then in, to undertake the, the Route 9 work, there was an earlier traffic study done by the town, I think in partnership with the state. So there is data there. The applicant has also done their own uh, research and traffic um, study and analysis. And so they have information to support, you know, what they're showing for parking. But it may be that the board wants someone to review what the applicant has submitted in terms of, you know, is their parking demand accurate in terms of other standards? You know, is it, you know, you know, do we need to have a bit more or are there other impacts in terms of, say, traffic patterns? And so uh, in North Square, for instance, when that was being proposed, there was uh, it's a mixed use comprehensive permit. There was a lot happening in North Amherst at the time. And there was questions about what would happen with, you know, if everything's occupied and there's so many vehicle trips a day, would it impact the two roads, Sunderland Road and Route 63? And so we hired a peer reviewer 
not to conduct a new traffic analysis, but to review the data and information provided by the applicant to determine if the conclusions arrived at were accurate. And so uh, that's how we did it. And it was determined that you know, what was provided uh, helped answer questions in terms of traffic impact. And so you know, at this time, I'm not sure right, if, if it, the board thinks it's necessary, but like I said, it's something that could be available if we find that there's an aspect of the project that needs more clarification beyond expertise of town staff. Great. All right. Mr. Wagner, I don't think there's any questions about um, peer review, so you can start on your more detailed presentation. And I think it's on the, uh, is it, the, are you starting on the Southeast site? Or Belchertown Road site? Belchertown Road, please. Go ahead. Yep. And we'll we'll be focusing pretty much uh, on the site design. And I know, as stated earlier, that we're gonna we're gonna have uh, lots of time together, and we'll get into to the building design itself more as as uh, as this process goes along. So tonight we're focused primarily on on site design. Um, you've you've seen a little bit of this image before, but a lot of thought went into where to place the building. And uh, we had significant collaboration with, uh, with the town planners around this, thinking about where it goes. Does it go to the rear of the site? Does it go out on the street? And uh, to, to align with uh, the, the, the planning uh, department's notion that this area is, is thought to be a future uh, village center, uh, it, it seemed appropriate that the building would be set closer to the street and the parking at the rear. So you, you see how that works and you see how uh, the building is tightly fitted in there along with the parking, uh, primarily to respond to the wetlands. So the wetlands are a huge part of the context here. Other parts of the context you'll see in this street elevation, uh, 100 feet going to each side of the building. We're looking at a, a street uh, facing elevation here. Uh, they're the single family houses that were referred to earlier. And you can, you can see the massing of the building, the way it sits on the site. We've also thought about a pedestrian approach to the site to, to make this pedestrian friendly so that, that uh, people um, know where the primary entry is to the, the building and can easily get there from both directions along Belchertown Road. You can also see that sidewalk from uh, Colonial uh, Gardens that was referred to earlier by Jamie um, across uh, Belchertown Road. We've shown a floor plan here just to give you a sense, not to get into the building design too much, but to understand that the, the front entry is facing Belchertown Road. There's a lot of common area in the core of the building, and it actually goes through the building to a courtyard at the back. So the way the, the site has been organized is a kind of a public facing uh, front of the building, but circulation goes through the building to a courtyard on the back that responds to the wetlands and is, has easy access to the, uh, to the parking as well. I thought we'd show you the roof plan as well because uh, it has to do with site design and solar orientation. Um, we've got a lot of pitched roofs around the perimeter of the building, but internally to the building, we have uh, quite a bit of uh, real estate here that's flat. And the idea is that that will be used for mechanical equipment as well as solar panels. Uh, the building will certainly be PV ready. And the hope is that if the budget allows, we'll be able to include solar arrays within the uh, within the construction itself. And just to give you a, a, a look at the front uh, elevation facing the street, this is uh, along Belchertown Road and the, the backside facing the courtyard um, and the, uh, the areas that uh, have a little bit uh, different treatment are, are signifying the, the entrances at the front and at the back on the courtyard. And we wanted to give you a little bit of a, a tour around uh, the building and the site uh, three-dimensionally. So the view here uh, seen um, from Belchertown Road, you can see how that walkway uh, pulls you into the entry or can take you down the drive to the parking at the rear. Um, this is really from Colonial uh, Gardens across the way. It's kind of a straight elevation. The, uh, the view here is toward the courtyard. So we're standing in the parking lot now at the rear of the building, looking into the courtyard. Uh, we're gonna see a plan in a little bit, uh, you, the lighting plan, you'll be able to see how that works as well. 
And then lastly, you can kind of see an aerial here of, of how this sits on the site, the wetlands being in this back part of the site uh, and, and defining just where the parking goes. We have uh, uh, a parking ratio that uh, was gonna get some attention when we look at the civil drawings, but it's, it's approximately uh, one to one. Then lastly, this is our, uh, our uh, electrical site electrical plan. Uh, you can see that we've got uh, bollards running along the driveway here, lighting bollards. Uh, they're there. Uh, we've also got a transformer that sits at this corner of the site, uh, closest to where our electrical room is. And the bollards will uh, go around to the back to the courtyard area. And then pole mounted site lighting is back here around the perimeter of the parking lot turning in and uh, there'll be fixtures that uh, control for uh, for light trespass as well to stay on the site and not uh, not uh, shed light onto the uh, to the abutters. Um, the question about uh, EV charging stations was asked earlier. These are all uh, double EV charging stations for all these spaces here. We uh, we realized uh, after this was done that we'll also need an EV charging station uh, located at one of the accessible spaces. So the accessible parking also has. Uh, EV um, hookup as well. So I will leave it there uh, and ask if we want to ask questions now or move on to the civil portion of the presentation. No, I, I think it's a good place to ask questions if people have questions regarding uh, the site design, landscape, lighting, etc. On, on the Belchertown Road. I have one, just one quick question. All the lights are going to be dark. Are they going to be dark sky compliant? Yes. We do provide cut sheets for that. You're not asking for a waiver from that requirement. We are not. All right. And I did hear that you you asked for a waiver from the an earlier waiver in the residential rental bylaw. Is that correct? That was, uh, that is correct, uh, Ellen, do you want to? Yeah, there, yep. there are certain um, requirements that we've asked waivers from. I have them, um, they're, they were, we were going to discuss them later, but yes. I can, I I can bring them up sure, if necessary. I just yeah. want to make sure I understood that. So we will discuss it later, but I just want to make sure I understood the, the point that was made. Okay. Yes. Good. Okay. I have no other questions. Anybody else? Okay, you can proceed, Mr. Wagner. Very good, thank you. I'm gonna pass it along to our civil engineers, uh, Niche Engineering. Thanks, Bob. Uh, good evening, members of the board, uh, esteemed members of the public and the town. Um, so this is the uh, Belchertown Road site we were just discussing, just an aerial view. Um, you can see Belchertown Road right here and then the three parcels that are being consolidated for this project. Um, as uh, Bob and others have mentioned, there is a uh, bordering vegetated wetland on this property. You can see that uh, by the red line shown here. Uh, and then we also have the 25 foot, 50 foot, 75 foot and 100 foot buffers shown um, on these plans in addition to all of the rest. Um, and then the property line, as you can see it go into the uh, conservation wetland area and then around the property with Belchertown uh, situated at the bottom of the page. Uh, the erosion control for this project includes construction fencing, um, wattles uh, that at the recommendation of the Conservation Commission will likely be either mulch or compost. Uh, the stabilized construction entrance will have um, the minimum length uh, needed to displace soil or a wheel wash station if needed as well uh, to make sure that there's no uh, sediment or uh, debris tracking onto the Belchertown Road. Um, the, as, uh, Jamie mentioned as well, the two existing buildings will be demolished on site. Um, and there will also be a uh, demolition of the existing utility services that exist. Um, this is the proposed site. You can see the proposed building that Bob just discussed right here. Belchertown Road still at the bottom. Uh, the red line work is the, uh, roadway line work that the, uh, town is currently, uh, working on. So if you've been by that area recently, uh, you know that the town is doing some work uh, for roadway and utility improvements in Belchertown Road. Uh, we've been coordinating with Jason 
um, on you know curb cut location and also utility stub location, so we don't have to uh, go back into that road once it's paved. Um, also, as Bob mentioned, the parking, you can see we have a, a row of compact spaces on the left of this page, so 12 compact spaces, and then we have uh, 24 plus six, so 30 standard spaces uh, situated in the center and then right of the page. And then you have the accessible spaces with the uh, accessible walkway behind with tactile warning strip and uh, appropriate signage. Uh, we have a 24 foot minimum width uh, drive lane uh, that allows two-way access for driving. Um, these drive lanes have been reviewed and approved by the fire department um, in uh, regards to the turning movements for their smaller and larger trucks. We have two dumpsters, as Jamie mentioned, one for uh, single stream recycling, one for trash that we picked up. Uh, we've also run the movements for these dumpsters uh, in order to be picked up um, on their weekly or biweekly schedule as needed. Um, skipping ahead, so these are the uh, pervious and impervious um, figures that we presented last night at the Conservation Commission. So this is just showing, you know, green is the pervious area. That's area that is um, more accepting of stormwater impervious is area that has, you know, le it's more like paved areas that don't accept stormwater as readily. And then red is existing building area. And then the proposed map within the buffers is shown here. Um, and then, you know, one thing you'll note on most of these plans is we have this, you know, graded area. So that is the stormwater basin. And we'll be getting into that uh, when we go to the utility plan. Um, moving on to the utilities. So this building will be serviced by uh, sewer um, out the front of the building, uh, electrical and telecom, as Bob mentioned uh, earlier. So you can see the transformer at the bottom of the site, also some telecom hand holes connecting to the electrical room. Uh, there will be a fire protection and a domestic water service um, out the front as well. They'll be connecting to the uh, water main uh, that is located underneath the Belcher Town Road sidewalk. Additionally, uh, there is a pretty robust stormwater system. You can see the downspout connections that uh, ferry the water from around the building out to the back. Um, so the front downspouts from the sloped roof system all run over here to this riprap apron. So it's a flared end section to slow down storm water with a riprap system. Um, and then it discharges to this long basin area that I was discussing earlier. So this basin is a uh, infiltration basin uh, slash bioretention basin sort of hybrid system. So it's more robust than your typical uh, infiltration basin. Uh, an infiltration basin is typically just a grass surface, uh, grass surface with, um, you know, just subgrade below it, nothing too uh, special about it. Uh, what we're proposing instead has more bioretention elements to it. So it's more green infrastructure. Uh, it has a sand mixed soil um, with restorative wetland plantings um, that will support pollinator habitats, uh, replicate more uh, closely to the, the local plantings and native plantings that already exist on site. Um, and also have uh, treating elements for nutrients and TSS for the stormwater. We are meeting MS4 requirements um, for this site, which is phosphorus removal and total suspended solids removal. So this water will be significantly cleaner um, than uh, the mass DEP stormwater regs uh, require alone. So this is above and beyond the Massachusetts stormwater regs. Uh, Additionally, for the parking lot area and the back of the site, the stormwater is carried through a similar system. Uh, the roadway is being picked up by catch basins. Those catch basins go through water quality structures. So these are gonna be in the uh, frame of like a hydrodynamic separator. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with hydrodynamic separators, they are stormwater systems that accept water from catch basins and then create a cyclonic um, motion within these like manhole type structures. The, uh, cyc the cyclone um, allows the suspended salts to be thrown to the sides and then they get collected in a sump in the bottom of the structure and then clean water passes through out of the system. Um, once that water continues to move through, it will go to a riprap apron similar to the roof water uh, and then make its way into the infiltration basin. So this infiltration basin is sized um, for a minimum of one inch of recharge of the impervious area on site. So an inch of the rainwater that falls in the impervious area will be completely held, treated and, and infiltrated down through this basin. Um, that will treat about 85% to 90% of storms that this site will experience. Um, in heavier storms, 
uh, there is a riprap spillway right here in the back. So in those really heavy storm events, you know, we'll still treat that first inch, which is where most of the pollutants are anyways. Um, but then instead of, you know, causing flooding on site, it will overflow into the wetland. Um, this is actually reducing a rate um, far lower of uh, runoff than the existing site has prior to development. Um, so this is a huge improvement, um, even when compared to the existing site. Um, and then uh, snow storage, we have snow storage completely outside the buffers. So that is uh, shown here in the blue hatching. Um, so for a typical snowstorm, uh, we'll have all the snow stored outside of the 100 foot buffer, as mentioned. Um, for larger storm events, uh, there may have to be trucking. Um, but Wayfinders has already uh, mentioned that they are, uh, we'll have hiring external contractors if the need arises. Um, Per your regulations, we also perf uh, perform the cut fill plans. Uh, this is just a standard cut fill um, and it's included with the plan set if you'd like to take a closer look. Um, and then also there's the uh, waiver request for the um, fill of over two feet for an area greater than 10,000 square feet area. This plan just um, shows that we are filling an area of over two feet of fill in uh, greater than 10,000 square feet. Um, and that's one of the waivers we're requesting as part of this project. Um, and with that, I will yield for questions. Um, and if there's no questions, then I'd be turning it over to the LA. Coleman, could I ask you just to go back to the parking plan a second? Just to, I want to point out to folks, or you could point out where the drop-off area is. For, it could be for package delivery. It could be for residents to be dropped off. Absolutely. Great point, Bob. So right here at the rear entrance, um, there is this striped drop-off area. Um, so it's extra long. It can handle um, at least a few vehicles. Um, maybe, you know, even two larger uh, packaging vehicles, but uh, this drop-off can be used for uh, just, you know, gas or uh, residents who might be less mobile being dropped off at this rear entrance or for uh, packaging um, or during moving. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Malloy, do you have a question or a comment? Sure, yeah, I, I just wanted to mention that this uh, project went through the Conservation Commission last night uh, and it was continued for a bit. And I know, you know, talking with Aaron Jock, the town's wetland administrator, there was some discussion about, uh, you know, e either using the, the island in the parking lot or changing some of the landscape around the parking lot for to accept drainage. And I just wasn't sure, you know, if Wayfinders has considered that or if you think you know, if, for instance, you, will you be making changes when you go before you go back to the Conservation Commission so that these plans will change a little bit? Or, you know, have you had any discussion about that? So just, you know, so for the ZBA's purpose, there could be, you know, some minor changes here. I just want to see if there's any consideration for what was discussed last night. Yeah, I can address that. So absolutely. Great question. Um, so we are still considering it um, because it was just last night. We haven't gotten into any serious discussions yet. Um, this plan, as you mentioned, still might change a little bit. Um, any of the changes that would happen would just be beneficial in terms of stormwater treatment. Um, there wouldn't be any regression in terms of uh, stormwater treatment, but um, we're still exploring. We don't know if the center island is the best option. Um, we want to make sure it still works with the EV charging and balance all the needs of the site. Um, but yeah, the, we're, we're still considering. And that, sorry, that wouldn't change the number of parking spaces necessarily or anything at this point. It's just that would not change the number of parking spaces. There was a question from the Conservation Commission to consider less parking. Um, but again, we're still considering all of our options. We haven't um, we haven't uh, settled on any one um, thing yet. Thanks. Mr. Sloviter. I believe you use the term uh, on the topic of snow fall, snow removal. I believe you use the term for the usual snowstorm, and I just wonder what the definition of a usual snowstorm, how much snow is a usual snowstorm? Um, that's a great question. So there's actually not, this <laughs> snow storage, there is no typical snow, snow, um, snowfall anymore, especially it seems to be less and less every year. Um, so this snow storage plan was based on like a typical snowfall in the past like 10 years as far as amount goes, it varies because of the density of snow. Sometimes you have wet snow, sometimes you have dry snows. It, there's not a one standard snow depth, um, but it's you know typically just based on a, a standard in the last 10 years, Boston winter um, well, that may I, decrease. Yeah, I don't have any idea what a standard snowfall is for the last 10 years, but you have, you had depicted 
a certain amount of snow storage. And I'm not trying to pin you down. I just would like to understand it better. Are you talking about um, four to six inches or six to eight? Or obviously, you're not talking about two feet. That's no, not, I'm not definitely. Talking about that. <laughs> yeah. But uh, will will your site handle a four to six inch snowfall without needing uh, ex uh, subcontractors to truck the snow away? Are you thinking four to six or a foot? I'm going to um, ask if I can run some numbers and get some more serious cubic footage back to you and then give you a more concrete answer, if that's okay. <laughs> it's perfectly fine. I just would like to understand. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions before they move on in the presentation? All right, proceed. All right, I'll kick it over to DJ um, from CBI. Terrific, thank you, Coleman, and thank you, Chair and members of the board. Um, just a moment here and I'll get the screen share going. There we go. Um, move the photos off to my other screen so that I can see, so that you all can see the entirety of this. Um, so yes, we're looking at an illustrative planting plan of the site. Um, I'll start with the, the back and the, the bioretention basin and so forth. Um, as mentioned, we've got two different planting mixes on the slopes. We have sort of a, uh, a, it's a native uh, wildflower mix that's appropriate for the, the slopes from New England wetland plants out of Amherst. Uh, we can get this. We may have provided in the permit application the specifics of what that seed mix is, but it's it'll be appropriate for the usually dry slopes of the, of the basin on that side. And then down in the bottom of the basin is an erosion control slash restoration mix for detention basins and moist sites also from New England wetland plants. So that's the, the sort of denser dotted hatch at the bottom in the lighter green. Um, and that will really, over time, the um, successful plants establish a good community down there. They can take inundation in the rainstorms and then dry back out. Um, as Coleman said, it it eventually will, the, the plants that are more successful in there end up working out. And I believe that the plan for maintenance in the, in the basin area of those two seed mixes is a seasonal or annual mowing to keep them trimmed um, and under control, uh, but otherwise to let them grow over the course of the seasons. And then on the back slope, as it transitions into the actual wetland, we have a mix of both seed mix and larger um, native wetland appropriate shrubs, uh, most of which you can see along the, the outer edges. So, you know, silky dogwoods, um, other a very a mix of of plants that would be appropriate to that environment to transition from the developed portion of the site into the undisturbed undisturbed area out there. Um, and then we have a series of a number of shade trees or small shade trees on the hill. There are a number of flowering trees sort of forming uh, accent in the courtyard, columnar trees along the perimeter in the sort of narrower spaces on the frontage and on the, the side. And then in and around the courtyard area, we've got um, perennial plantings. We haven't developed a exhaustive um, planting plan for them yet, but we do have a selection of perennials and ground covers that we're planning on using. And I should say all of the all of the plant material proposed for the site is native um, with the very slight, uh, I'll put it out there because otherwise someone will someone will flag it. Uh, we are proposing rather than a strict native dogwood, um, which have some pest problems and disease issues, an improved hybrid, which is a 
a hybrid of the native dogwood and a and a non-native dogwood and it performance wise it it provides a lot of the same pollinator value and so forth for for the community without the disease and pest issues that the native plants have that said if and presumably it's it's more the concom jurisdiction if they take issue with that they may, that may end up switching out to a disease resistant native cultivar instead um but other than that one exception which is the three flowering trees in the courtyard uh only one of which is actually inside the 100 foot buffer everything proposed is native and the perennials and ground covers have a an emphasis on pollinator value and and so forth as well. Um, and then we have screen plantings of eastern cedar, eastern red cedar, between the parking lot and the abutting property uh, where the screening is really needed from that respect. Other than that, we've got seeded lawn in closer to the perimeter um, and to the building. And uh, a shrub bend perennial buffer for ornamental value at the entrance with sort of a lower zone highlighting the front entry and a little bit of shrub mass for evergreen and seasonal seasonal interest. Um, there are images of most of the proposed plantings um, of the trees and shrubs. We didn't didn't have room on the page to fit all the perennials and ground cover. It's the basic planting scheme. I don't know whether if the board would like, I can go through the plantings in more detail with you. Um, but I did also want to address the other feature of screening, which is, since I know it will come up, and let me double check. Uh, that's the street plants, sorry. Here we go. Um, so we also have, as was mentioned, a, a small storage shed, which, still in the design process, but a, you know, a, a shake siding, um, color to be selected, trim and door, asphalt shingled roof, um, essentially a small wooden shed. Um, we're looking at, you know, for the site furniture, typical movable tables and chairs, attractive metal sturdy benches, um, bicycle racks, all of which were, in the process of of selecting, we have proposed proposed features on here that we'd be happy to respond to. And then around the trash and recycling enclosure, we have a you know a, a I don't see a height on this, and I honestly don't remember it myself. But it looks to me like it's about a six foot tall fence. It certainly will be tall enough to screen the the dumpsters in any case, um, with a pedestrian gate in the middle for access. Um, yeah, I think that that pretty much sums it up. I'll flop back to the plan and open it up for questions if. Where is where is the, Mr. Shotgun? Where yeah. is the, that shed gonna be? Ah, is yes, so the, the shed is, is this rectangle oh, okay, just above you. the dumpsters. Um, and I noticed looking at this that the the shed is shown with an end entry, yeah. and our elevations had had a, a side entry. I I think unless I got the plan sets backwards. Um. So yeah, that would be so. It would be this shed, but with the the doors presumably on the gable end rather than on the the mm -hmm. side. Okay. Yep. BJ, would you mind going back to the parking lot? I'd just like to point out one thing. It's part of the site design here. It's, you know, it's a, a pretty significant uh, a parking lot, but you can see the locations of the trees. And in part, they've been placed there to help reduce heat island effect. So yes. trees and casting a shadow on all that paving uh, has, has been shown to, to decrease the, the temperature in the summertime in that area. So uh, just to point that out as a part of the site design. Thank you. Yeah. Any other any questions, any questions on the landscape plan? All right. 
All right. I think, Mr. Wagner, that's, I think we've gone through site design, landscaping, lighting, parking for Belchertown Road. Is there anything else you want to say before we leave Belchertown Road and move to East Street? I think we're all set. That completes uh, that part of our presentation. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'll get to you in just a second, Mr. Malloy. We're coming on 720. We normally take our five minute break about 730 and this is just fortuitous that it's at the right time. So uh, after Mr. Malloy's comment, uh, we'll break for five minutes and then we'll come back. So Mr. Malloy. Sure. Yeah. If you just bring up that illustrative plan again, I, I just wanted to make one comment. You know, and I, I, I had uh, expressed this uh, as part of a staff review. You know, when you're when you're arriving at the site, you'll see the fence here. And I had I had asked if it was possible to put some plantings in front of the dumpster fence whether mm. to soften it or not. And I know, Bob, in one of your plans, it looked like there had been a planting there. And so I wasn't sure if there has been any, you know, decision about what could happen in that little space where the cursor is located. In there. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, not being as deeply in the project as, as my colleague Kayla, um, I don't, I don't know whether there was a reason that that was, considered and not put in, or if the comment simply came um, later than our last revision of this plan. Mm -hmm. Looking at it, I don't see a reason we couldn't include planting there, um, unless there's something that Bob or anyone else from the team remembers um, that was a reason. Snow, yeah, I mean, it might be snow oh. storage. Sorry, I just don't. Possible. There, there might be. I think it's still a, a really good and valid uh, uh, suggestion or comment, Nate. And uh, I think it's important because you're you're going down that driveway. So at the end point of that driveway, I think it'd be really nice to see some uh, some vegetation and not the not the side of the uh, the dumpster enclosure. Mm -hmm. Sure. And then a second question would be, you know, the transformer box in the corner. You know, is there any way to screen that, or is there? Would you also know if what dimensions that would be? So is that like a 10 by 10 by six uh, height or, and then, you know, is there a way to screen it? Sure, it's... I would defer to the electrical on that. Um, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, we've, we've looked into it some, it's, it's very challenging to try to screen it. We're not allowed to enclose it uh, without a lot of clearance around it or, or plant up near it. Um, so we've, we've been looking into that uh, and trying to place it so that it's, it's, it's not, uh, what the sight lines are, are not so um, prominent. Um, sure. We can continue to do that. We're, I'm still not sure we actually have a, a final size, but I think you're probably not too far off in those dimensions. It might be a little smaller, might be eight by 10, but we don't have a final size yet on it. Sure, yeah, I mean, I, I think so I bring that up to the board, you may have seen it, but especially with electric buildings, we're seeing you know more you know, utility infrastructure, right? Whether it's meters or you know, transformer boxes or other things. And so, uh, you know, the planning board has been noticing it more and, you know, asking more about that. And, you know, it is difficult with utility companies, I get it, you know, and, and fire separation with the building. And so right. between fire and utilities, there's a lot of requirements and where that's cited. Uh, but I, I just wanted to ask. Thanks. I, I will say that at least based on where it's currently placed um, and the dimensions that I typically see around those, I don't think we'd have room to screen it from the front. In, in this case, from the street side, which obviously would be the most um, the most important to screen <laughs> if it were possible. Um, but as Bob said, we'll continue to look into it for sure. I just had one question that I, I, just, I just thought of again. So the infiltration basin is designed for um, it's not going to retain water. It's supposed to water is supposed to flow into that basin and then be soaked up by the ground. What kind of what? How much rain do you need to get to have this to have standing water for a couple of hours or several hours in that infiltration basin? And I'm just wondering about safety for for kids or something that are living there. Um, maybe it's not a problem. It might be better than it currently is um, in that area. But um, talk to me about how quickly the water infiltrates into this, the, the infiltration basin. The, so it's 
designed to infiltrate over a 72 hour period um, per Massachusetts DP standards. Um, in regards to exactly how fast uh, it's going to end up when we get the soil shop drawings, we're going to have to, you know, do some infiltration testing um, for a one inch storm, you know, that should infiltrate within that 72 hour period. That's going to be, you know, the largest storm out of like 85% of storms um, for smaller storms, it's going to infiltrate faster and obviously be a, l a less time period um, that it's sitting in there. Um, but I, for, I don't have for a couple hours, unfortunately. So you're still doing soil sampling out there that you or is so you won't know the answer to that until you do some further work or is that uh, uh, the soil that we'll be using for this uh basin is an engineered soil so it wouldn't be the existing soil that we're basing the infiltration rates on it would be on that engineered soil um right. so we'd have to you know get the shop drawing on that soil to confirm the exact numbers all right so later on in the process that would be just good to have yep absolutely I'm sorry just to now. just to jump in though there is a spillway right so do you know like what is the you know, I mean, at some point, the water will exit the detention area or bioretention area from the spillway. So is there a depth there? Correct. There is. Um, that overflow elevation is... So it's 172 is the invert of that. And Josh, you can backtrack me on this. I think the elevation is 172 for the... 172 point two is the elevation and 172 is the bottom so it's only a couple inches coleman if it would help i'm happy to stop screen sharing and let you put the grading plan up if you think that would clarify yeah well let me do that that'd be great um but actually yeah, yeah so the i just confirmed it provide the required recharge volume so given the large footprint of the basin itself and the large bottom area you actually don't need a significant depth to meet that recharge factor. Um, and then the system itself is designed otherwise to just slow the water down to the pre-development rates of runoff to the wetland area. And that's that's performed through um, some relief culverts, through a berm, and then we have the emergency spillway, which is essentially just um, a riprap portion of stone on top of the berm that'll just free flow over into the wetland. Correct. And I just confirmed it's, it'll never be more than eight inches of water in there before it starts overflowing. So eight inches is the max depth before it starts overflowing in the spillway. Thank you. All right. I'm ready to take a break unless anybody else has questions for the, the Belchertown road site. Okay. We'll all come back at uh, 735. See you in six minutes.
Well, it looks like we have everybody back uh, from the board. We have uh, presenters for Wayfinders. Um, Mr. Wagner, are you going to continue in that role? Yes, yes, I am. Thank you. All righty. You can begin. All right. I'll uh, share the uh, similar set of drawings here for uh, Southeast Street. This uh, gives you a, a good view of the context of the neighborhood. You can see there's there's a lot of residential. There's there's some other uh, uses. A, a church, the school is not too far. Uh, kind of plan aerial plan here south. Uh, you can see the playing field there quite clearly, which is a wetlands. It's a, another wetlands. Both these projects uh, are responding to wetlands conditions. And we're also looking at uh, an existing school. So the existing red brick schoolhouse uh, is, is being renovated into six units. So this, this building or this uh, project, this site will, will be 38 units, six of them, or 37 units, excuse me, six of them being in the school. Uh, and we're gonna, we're gonna kind of go around the site and look at the, the site implications here, the site design. But I'll start by saying, uh, even though we're in a, in a predominantly single family neighborhood, uh, a lot of uh, per, pretty traditional New England style uh, architecture, the, the concept here was to, to look at the, both the site and the building as more of a, a New England kind of inn and to have that be the um, sort of the, the precedent for how we went about looking at the, the building design and the site design. You'll see here down below again, a little bit of a context street elevation uh, the scale of, of buildings to uh, both the, the left and the right here within the, the 100 foot uh, distance from the property lines. Uh, the school uh, you're going to see is is not totally visible straight ahead, but it is visible. And there was an, uh, an emphasis to try to uh, make sure that the qualities, the historic qualities of that were, were not um, screened by the uh, by the new building. So. Here's a view um, from the uh, from the common um, across the street. There, you can you can see the school and the entry. Uh, we wanted to preserve that entry or really reactivate that entry. That's a part of the, the site design site design here. Um, as mentioned earlier, the drive is pretty much the same as it is now. That leads to some satellite parking in the back. We'll see more about that earlier or later. I mean. Uh, you're seeing the the uh, the transformer here as well that we talked about. Uh, we're not able to really put much screening. We started trying to put screening around it, but uh, found out that the the utility company won't allow us to to do that without significant space between the uh, the screen and the uh, the transformer. Uh, the the architecture itself is again street facing, and uh, the scale of it was intended to uh, to recall the, the New England end and the residential architecture in the neighborhood. Uh, a brief look at the the um, the floor plan, the the ground floor plan. We'll get into this at uh, subsequent meetings, but uh, we have a direct uh, main entry here facing Southeast Street. But for those who are, are parking, they would come in through the courtyard. So the courtyard is, a, is a, a significant feature of this site design, creating this outdoor room or space that's defined by the school, the link that connects the old and the new, and also becomes the entry, the primary, another primary entry into the building and uh, is oriented around the common area here that you see in the, in the kind of the orange and yellow spaces. Once again, we'll look at the, uh, the roof plan just to see how that works for solar orientation. In a similar fashion uh, as the, uh, the Belchtown Road, we've created a flat area on the back that's for mechanical equipment and for, uh, for PV arrays. Uh, the roof is uh, also a good candidate for that. It's a flat roof. Uh, if, if you've seen older, older photos of this, the school was not only, always a flat roof. It had a pitched roof at one time but it is now a, a flat roof building and will serve as another um, uh, area for, um, for uh, solar panels. Some street facing elevations. 
um, you can see the the way the building is is uh, very street facing, has a strong presence to the street with uh, a, a noticeable entry um, from the public sidewalk. And um, even though it's it's not an actual porch, we we were attempting to capture the feeling of a New England porch across the front of the building um, on this on this facade. And other facades, particularly the, the courtyard facade, you can see this is the length, the narrower portion of the building um, that helps create the courtyard on this side or on the back side, leaves a little bit of room to the, uh, to the property line. And we'll move into the, the three-dimensional drawings again, kind of a similar series of drawings. This lower right one showing the courtyard space, the school with a reactivated entry, this is south facing, so uh, this should get some some great uh, some great daylighting, and there's a little bit of a canopy entry canopy uh, that uh, defines this uh, this entrance that will serve most of the people who uh, who park here and get into the building. I didn't mention the uh, the spaces over here, but this is all a common area. So this also this the, uh, the site design of the courtyard will serve as overflow space or kind of a a common connection between indoor and outdoor for the community space um, that's in the lower level of this wing of the building. You can kind of see how it all works here and a little bit of a, a, a raised view to see the, the school entry and the courtyard space. And again, a more aerial view that shows those spaces and how it uh, fits uh, or, or set back from the street a little bit. We're going to talk more about parking. Uh, uh, Coleman will get into that, but I'll just note here that there's been some discussion about added parking on the street here as well. And Nate may be able to give us some update on, on what's going on there or the potential for that, for some overflow or visitor parking. Take a quick look at the, uh, the lighting for this site. Um, we've got, uh, again, a series of, of lighting bollards along this path, and I should mention that there, there is a, a walkway uh, from the public sidewalk to get back into the, uh, to the playing field areas. It does, it does uh, access this parking area, but the intent is to maintain um, a, a walkway to the wetlands or the fields or at the rear of the site. And then we've got other lighting scattered around into the courtyard area. And there'll be some uh, entry lighting or building mounted lighting uh, for areas for, of, of entry. There actually are multiple entries besides this main one that you saw. There's another egress uh, exit over here. Besides the main entry into the schoolhouse, there are a couple other uh, secondary entries into the schoolhouse. And lastly, another egress that goes to the back that will get people to the uh, to the trash and recycling that's located in the rear of the site that we'll see when uh, Coleman takes us into uh, the next part of the presentation. Any questions from board members for Mr. Wagner before we start the next portion? Okay. Turn it over to uh, to Coleman again. Okay, so um, the Southeast Street site, uh, just to orient yourself again, we've got Main Street here to the north and then Southeast Street and the uh, common over here on the right of the page, uh, the existing school building you can see right here from the aerial and then this is the existing uh, basketball court slash parking area. This green line I've drawn in, um, so Nathan mentioned this earlier, but this is the uh, restoration of the culvert and stream um, that the town is pursuing as a restoration area. So right now the culvert um, has collapsed uh, and it falls, uh, it runs underneath the parking area. Uh, Aaron and the Conservation Commission in the town are looking at replicating the stream around this parking um, area, which would be a great environmental benefit to the project. Um, but just wanted to call that out uh, before we got too deep into the site design. Um, as far as the site preparation um, demolition plan goes, so again, we are planning on having construction fencing um, and erosion control uh, blankets, uh, mulch socks around the perimeter of the site. Uh, this area, um, you can see the wetland here in red again, um, and then approximated wetland in the, uh, the Butters property. But uh, this area where we're getting a little close to the wetland uh, slope over here, 
uh, Aaron and the Conservation Commission have requested that we do a double up of both a silt fence and a uh, mulch sock. Uh, the project is amenable to that. So we are looking into beefing up the erosion control along that, that border a little bit, uh, a little bit more. Um, we are maintaining the existing building, as Bob mentioned, and, and expanding on it, um, and then removing some trees and some utilities across the property. Um, for the next, so this is the, the proposed uh, layout with the building. You can see the existing school building again, built upon um, and expanded. Uh, Southeast Street over here is to the south. Um, we have a, a driveway entrance 20 feet wide, um, which is the minimum allowed for fire access. Uh, we do have a 17 foot section over here, but this has been run by the fire department and they've cleared it with the turning movements that this is acceptable to them. Um, and then the rear of the site, we have a 24 foot, uh, area behind the parking. Um, the, what's really unique about this roadway versus the Belchertown road site is this, uh, asphalt is actually all porous asphalt. So, um, I'll get a little bit deeper into that when we get to the recharge system, but this is asphalt that allows, uh, rainwater to drain completely through it, as opposed to collecting and sheet flowing, uh, like a, like a normal asphalt, uh, as like, uh, Bob mentioned, there's, uh, standard spaces and then ADA spaces at the front of the site. So there's four standard spaces and then two, uh, accessible spaces. And then at the rear of the site, there are, um, eight standard spaces and then one parallel space, um, with a hammerhead turnaround. There will also be a 12 foot wide uh, chained off access for the town to uh, run maintenance vehicles or, you know, some sort of access to the fields at the rear of the site. These rear, uh, these fields are used, um, to my understanding, as soccer fields and other athletic fields that are mowed and, and uh, kept maintained. Um, they are the wetland um, as far as the Conservation Commission is concerned. So, you know, we're not building within that zone, but, you know, that there is uh, access if the town requires it. The existing um, materiality plan, again, impervious is blue. So that's the existing pavement. Uh, pervious is green. So that's the existing like landscape areas. And then the red is the existing school building. Uh, you can actually see on this plan for the proposed, we're actually reducing the uh, amount of impervious in some of those 25 foot buffers. So the, the area really close to the wetland, um, we're increasing the pervious. And then the, the impervious that does exist, um, again, the porous asphalt is going to greatly reduce uh, the amount of sheet flow off from this area. And then uh, overall, there's the sidewalks uh, in the darker blue that are the actual, you know, site impervious, uh, really hardscape pavements, and then the red as well. Um, as far as utilities, we'll go again with just building services, and then we'll get to the stormwater last since that uh, tends to be a little bit more complicated. Uh, so the uh, fire hydrant, um, we'll be running a new fire hydrant service uh, with a hydrant uh, located on the property. Uh, sanitary service will pick up from the existing school system and the new proposed building, run to a manhole on site, which then connects to the 15-inch uh, sewer in Southeast Street. Uh, we're running a domestic and fire protection line um, back towards the water room in the existing school building. Um, and then as far as stormwater goes, again, this site has uh, a large number of downspouts, which will be collected and run around the buildings. Um, we're able, so you can see this all runs over here and then into the uh, porous asphalt section. And then the rear of the site will run along the rear. And then again, join the porous asphalt section and the perforated pipe. Uh, any water that falls on the site itself, that's not the roof, um, be that landscape, hardscape, or the porous pavement, uh, will be directed towards the porous pavement to infiltrate down. Um, so this section, there is a quite robust um, choker course in the top section. So there's the asphalt that's porous, a stone choker course, and then a filter course, and then a uh, small reservoir course with a pipe at the bottom. Uh, due to high groundwater on site, the system is lined. We're not able to infiltrate down into the ground because at uh, shallowest groundwater is only about uh, 0 0.7 feet below grade. Um, so we're not getting the uh, infiltration um, that we'd like to, but we are getting uh, water quality treatment and rate reduction. Um, so for, per the Massachusetts Stormwater Handbook, uh, we're meeting this to the great extent practicable, um, which due to the high groundwater infiltration is not a possibility, but we are still meeting uh, quality requirements and the rate reduction. Um, this water uh, that flows through this porous pavement uh, is picked up at the bottom of it by this uh, perforated pipe, and then that is currently routed to the existing culvert, um, but once the uh, stream is reconstructed along the backside of this area here, uh, the porous asphalt will daylight uh, the pipe into the stream as well and then help feed it 
um, to make sure that the wetlands stay wet and are able to support the hydric soils and wetland populations that currently exist on site. Um, we have uh, limited options for snow storage on this site um, due to, just due to the, the lack of open space. Um, again, we're, we don't have hard numbers today. We'll get you those numbers, um, but you know, this is definitely a, a, a tougher site to put snow on um, and we're planning for that accordingly. Um, standard cut fill, there is no waiver request for the two foot um, fill on this site because we're, we're keeping everything below, um, you know, two feet of fill or less um, for that area required. Um, and with that, I will uh, yield for questions. Any questions from board members? I thought I saw um, Mr. Sloater. Yes. Uh, is this an appropriate time to ask a parking question, or are we not on that yet? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yep. I think it is. Okay. Sloater, go ahead. Okay. Uh, on both of the sites, you're providing parking spaces approximately a half a space per unit, a slightly over a half a space at on the Belcher Town Road and slightly under a half a space, but close enough. Can you can you just go a little bit into the thinking that that is an adequate number of parking spaces for both properties? It's it's um, well below what we've seen in other projects where it's one parking space per unit. So there must be something about these projects that tells you that a thirty one space a 31 unit property is not going to require anywhere near 31 parking spaces so i am going to defer to jamie on these but um the belchertown road site is almost one to one for the ratio so i think it's 0.97 but i think jamie has the exact ratio jamie do you uh, oh yeah yeah Sorry. that one's point point nine seven. they we have uh 46 spots there for four oh i i'm sorry I, then yeah. that raises a then that really raises the question i I did the calculation and I I just I did not remember correctly the number of spots. Yeah. So so the the East Street property has a much lower percentage. Yeah. It's it's yeah. point four it's point four five, I think I I came up with. So just what's the thinking behind that? Um the the thinking is is that um there's on street parking here that's that's it's 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 not on site you know it's part of the development but we understand that the town is you know looking at doing a more formalized uh you know resident permit parking and um along the the frontage section of the property there's approximately 8 to 10 spots depending on how the the turnouts um, for the adjacent properties layout. Um, and with that, there's probably an additional uh, 10, 10 or 12 spots along the rest of the Southeast Street extension. So we, and we looked at a bunch of different scenarios as to get um, parking and with the layout of the existing school and where the wetlands are in order to, um, to, uh, you know, to 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 arrive at a at a design for a building that's um, you know both both economical and provides housing units. Um, this is this is where you know this is where the design uh, landed here. So it's but you, uh, you, know, it's but you feel but but you've you've looked into this thoroughly. You feel that the number of spaces that you've designated on the plans are adequate for this size building that was a question um yeah we're we're actually we're working on that too um and we have a detailed memo that's that we're working on to kind of explain all that and kind of step through the you know the the processes and and all the different variables that are involved with that one of them being that it's it's a very um kind of walkable area with you know a, a, a very um robust bus service that that you know travels on a pretty frequent schedule, you know, to get you downtown, but it is, it is something that, you know, we are discussing and we continue to discuss um, internally just to, you know, 
and and we are going to be providing the town with a memo on that as well. Thank you. Mr. Malloy, I know we talked a little bit about this, that the town has been taking some, has been looking at alternative parking outside the site on the streets. Can you just talk to me about what they're, for Mr. Um, Sloboda, what the town has done so far and then what they're looking for to come from the, uh, the developers here? Sure, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, some of the limited parking also stems from what, what the town put in the request for proposal. So. You know, we had a minimum number of affordable units uh, and other, you know, amenity spaces. And so, you know, some of the assumptions were when we want to develop both these sites, especially East Street, you know, there's a bus stop just, um, you know, up the, you know, just north on Main Street from here. Uh, you can go to College um, Street. And so it's very bikeable and walkable. And so, uh, the you know, so we thought, well, if it isn't a one to one, you know, you could have other non-vehicular methods of transportation, means of transportation. You know, the zoning bylaw has been updated too, and the planning board often uses it that a developer can waive, you know, certain amounts of parking if they can show that, you know, the demand, whether it's through, you know, all these other means of transportation, through uh, tenant lease agreements, through shared parking, you don't necessarily have to have, you know, a two to one or one to one ratio. Uh, you know, in terms of what's happening on, I call it the Southeast Street extension, the town has block grant funding to uh, extend all the water service connections from their six properties. There's a, a, a newer water line in the middle of the common. The one in the street actually is would be abandoned. And at the same time, we do some sewer upgrades and then we would repave the Southeast Street extension uh, to a you know 22 foot, 24 foot width with a newer sidewalk. And then, you know, it's a one way street heading south and we maintain um, on street parking on the side closest to, you know, what was shown here on this site. So on the West side. So currently it's uh, unregulated parking, meaning anyone can park there anytime, any, you know, unless there's a snow emergency, you know, residents now could park there without paying for a permit. Uh, you know, people taking the bus may park there sometimes, but you know, it's unregulated so you could use it. You know, when this development was, you know, <clears throat> taking shape, there's been discussions with you know different departments about setting aside, as Jamie mentioned, whether it's you know 10 to 12 spaces in front or the whole length of it, saying that this is a resident only um, permit sticker area. There's sections of this up on Nutting, Allen, and Fearing where you know if you live on that section of street, you can get a, a resident sticker, and it's enforced by the town by the parking enforcement officers. And so, you know, even if we we say that the six properties are the only ones who could park here, then all of a sudden there's you know 25 spaces or 30 spaces that are on the street that would only be used by the residents of you know those properties. And so that's something the town is seriously considering. It's really not that far from downtown in terms of parking enforcement. It wouldn't be like a, a public private agreement. It's a, a town uh, program, so it wouldn't be metered. It wouldn't be as if it were you know, wayfinders administering some parking, it's all on the town. Uh, and like I said, we do this in other places around the town center. So it is something that has been discussed. It would uh, it would need to go through an approval process with the town, but we, you know, in any event, we are gonna repave this road and formalize the parking. And so the parking will always be provided off site on the street. It's just a matter of, you know, would it be regulated with a permit or some other means? Thank you, Mr. Malloy. Um, Mr. Meadows. To coincide with that, I I noticed frequently that people who are waiting at the light at south in the corner of Southeast, Northeast, and Main Street um, don't like waiting at the light. Some don't, and they'll cut through on that Southeast Street extension, so named. Um, and I'm wondering if a combination of that plus uh, the people who are going to live on the street might necessitate a light or some other mode of restraint at the end of the street, since it's a one way and it's going to, going to come out at a fairly congested spot, particularly when school is in session and children are being brought in there. Did, have you developed any plans of that, thinking of that? 
Yeah, so the, the town's public works department uh, has working with, there's an engineer, CDM Smith, who's been doing the traffic analysis on the main section of, I'll call it Southeast Street. And then there's the new Fort River School that's being proposed. And so, uh, you know, in, in, the, in the coming weeks, they're going to talk about publicly about some strategies to manage parking on that section and more more traffic on Main Street, Southeast Street, and then the College uh, Street intersection. And so the town has had a few different ideas. They're going through kind of, you know, ground truthing with the engineering firm about how to handle traffic uh, and that in this whole kind of common area. And so, you know, it's independent of this project, but we're aware that with the school and this project, there will be more traffic um, on these streets. And so the town is coming up with ways to manage that. So it, it is under consideration then, okay. It is, it is, yeah. I, I think, I forget what date it is, but there will be a discussion um, publicly by Public Works uh, with town council about some ideas of how to manage uh, traffic right in this very area, you know, like I said, from Main Street to College Street with different ideas for, you know, intersections and pedestrians, uh, you know, we're, you know, in terms of newer crossings or safety signals or traffic coming. So. Thank you. Okay. I see no other hands up. You want to proceed to the next, uh, I guess, architecture and mechanical systems. Is that right? Uh, I believe, I I think from say. here, uh, Chairman Judge, we, we'd move into the landscape uh, design. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I, I jumped ahead. Go ahead. All right. Happy to. Um, so, let's see where to, where to begin on this one. I think we can start with the Southeast Street facade of things. Um, again, overall, the planting palette um, is entirely natives with the one exception of that dogwood, which is sort of on the border of, you know, it's an improved native in many respects. Um, they're perennial and ground cover palette. It's not quite the same mix of trees as the Belchertown Road site because of a difference in the, the overall character that we're going for here. Um, a few more, there are a few more oaks mixed into the palette here. Uh, and uh, instead of the columnar maples on the previous project. So we've got along the front of the building, three large scarlet oaks that are the, the larger circles flanked by some service berry or um, shad bush trees, amelanchia, that are a smaller large shrub, small tree, uh, depends how you count them. Um, Although we do have them specked out uh, as multi stems, so I guess they'd be closer to the large shrub end of things um, or a small multi stem tree. And then, you know, low shrub massing along the front, providing sort of a foundation for that. Uh, the, the front, the front side of a New England inn, as Bob was mentioning during the overall description, with a little bit of a lawn in front of it. It's telling me my internet was glitching. I don't know if uh, I lost you all there for a moment, but I, I seem to be back we now. We still hear you. That... We still hear you. Uh, you haven't okay, been able to great. change the page. Okay, perfect. Nope. Um, and I wasn't trying to change the page anyway, so wonderful. Yes, so there's a bit of a lawn in the forecourt. I just got a warning that flashed up on my screen. Your internet connection is unstable. <laughs> Wonders of modern technology. Yes. Um. Yeah, that's sort of the the front the front portion effect it's it's mostly shrub material open lawn um and then ground cover and perennial plantings along the the side as you go in and in the beds around the foundation of the school and the connector wing that Bob had talked about we've got one flowering tree that that dogwood in the courtyard to provide sort of a focal point to add some shade get a little bit more um, shading over the parking lot. The front of this sort of screening row or alley down the side, the first few trees are a columnar oak. And then we have uh, junipers, red cedars, the west of the way down, down towards the back. Alongside um, 
the, the fencing at the property line. And then, you know, a little bit of planting at the back um, just to provide foundation at the building, some witch hazel in around the storage shed and the dumpsters, which are tucked back behind the building. I think one thing that got mentioned briefly in the presentation about parking and so forth was bike racks. So those are located just to the left of the steps up to the old school entrance. Um, we've got parking for six bikes there, um, which is sort of necessitated by how how the ADA access from the crosswalk and the parking spaces needs to flow around that space. We couldn't really intrude much further over and shift the trash cans elsewhere. And then the walk goes to the back, crosses the street, goes onto the existing, you know, essentially grassy surface and out to the playing fields behind. That's the, oops, zoomed out a little further. The shed and the dumpster screening are very similar to what was on the Belchertown Road site. Um, same sort of general character. Happy to pull those details up if there are specific questions about them. But other than that, uh, what's got, the fence alongside the what's the fence alongside the uh, the walkway? Is that existing fence? Is it uh, cyclone? Uh -huh. Is it You'll have to forgive me. I I am not actually certain off the top of my head. Bob, do you happen to remember what that what that fence is? Is it meant to shade uh, to to obstruct light? Is that the the goal, or is it just that? Is a good question. I'm going to see if there's a detail for it in our. Um... You can bring it back later. Okay. It looks like. Let me double check on the plan that I'm looking at the right fence in the right place. Along, you can't see my mark. My cursor. that's okay. So you're you're asking about the. Um, are you still seeing the illustrative plan? Yes. Okay, hang on a moment. Let me let me swap what I'm sharing here. Share the whole screen instead of just the application I had open. So well, you're asking about the fence running down along this uh, southern edge of the property. Well, I, I don't know what I'm seeing right now. I'm seeing. Yeah, we see a park. Oh, oh, it's a really nice place, but I don't think it's. Whoops. I don't think it's there. Yeah. I think I shared the wrong screen. Yep. Yeah, I think you that's did. That's what I did. Yep. <laughs> that's a. That's my favorite park project I've ever worked on. That happens to be a mile and a quarter from my own house, and it's uh, well, it's very nice. It's my it's my lovely screensaver and uh, desktop image on my laptop. But um, yes, yeah, you're, okay. that, so now we're seeing your cursor is in the right place. Your cursor is okay. in the right yep. place. So this fence along the back, uh, along the southern edge here that separates the driveway from the property uh, is called out a six foot vinyl privacy fence on our drawings. I was able to answer that. All right. So it'd be a six foot tall, you know, yep. flat, vinyl flat yep. style vinyl, tongue and groove vinyl board fence. Yep. Okay. All right. Other questions on um, landscape and screen? Lighting is next, I think, guys. Okay. I, I just want to jump in and ask what what um you know what is the dumpster enclosure again? So is it it's not a, a vinyl um fence, materially? Yeah. Um you know, to be honest with you, I am not 100% certain. Um, we will, we may have to get back to you on that. It may be that we're still in development or it may be that. Uh, yeah, typically we've done, nice. we've done a wood uh, enclosure on that, Nate. Right. Okay. This does. I also, also just mentioned on the bike stores that we have uh, internal uh, you know, protected and secured bike storage at each side as well. Uh, mm -hmm. we've, we've done quite a bit. I mean, there's uh, at uh, at East Street. I'm looking here. We've got a a total of um, uh, 31 uh, uh, bike stations or parking uh, uh, stations, uh, and then uh, 
uh, over at the other site, we've got a total of 48. So it's a, kind of a one for one every unit uh, having a bar, uh, a bike parking space. That's on the interior plus the exterior that DJ mentioned or in addition to that it would be visitor parking. Perfect. Thank you. All right, I don't see any other questions. We can move on. Yeah, I believe that concludes. We had a brief, I'd be happy to bring it up again, uh, Chairman Judge. We had looked a little bit at the, the East Street uh, site lighting already, but yep. if there are any questions, happy to bring it up again. Not that I see. We've talked about parking. Do you, anything else you need to say on parking? I think we've covered it, right? I think we have, yes, thank you. And then there's presentations for both sites on architecture and mechanical systems. Are you prepared to do that tonight or we're we gonna do that at a later point? I believe that was uh, at, at subsequent meetings to talk more about the, okay. the architecture, interior design, and, and then uh, mechanical electrical systems for the building. Right. That's fine. Good. Um, this is the opportunity for members to ask any other questions they, they might have. Uh, before we go to public comment, but I want to make sure to give people an opportunity to ask some more questions on the general overview of the project and uh, before we go to public comments. Okay, uh, if there's no other questions, we'll move to public comment. So if you wish to speak, use the raise hand function on your on your of Zoom or press star nine on your phone. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people who wish to speak. When you're recognized, provide your name address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. Please limit your comments to about three minutes. Uh, and then after the end of uh, public comment, the applicant has an opportunity to respond to those comments. So Jacinta, do we have people who wish to do you have any people who wish to comment? Yes, I just admitted one person, but they've disappeared. Did you? I don't know why. I think they're, 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 they were brought in, Jacinta. I think they're... Okay. Yeah, I've seen a Kratzer. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Yeah. All right, give us, give us your name and address. And um... So my name is Angelica Kratzer, and um, we are here together with um, Elizabeth uh, Selkirk, my spouse. And we are a butters on three sides. Uh, we live on 7043 Main Street in the Noah Dickinson house. And uh, we want to give our support to the project. We are very enthusiastic about the project. We have been in touch with Wayfinders throughout the process. And so that was a very good experience. And uh, today we just have uh, one question. And uh, this is about uh, this connection piece that takes about um, <clears throat> half, um, off half of the Northern facade of the old school. And so we are a little concerned that uh, this means that a part of the facade, which uh, we think is historically uh, <clears throat> valuable, uh, will be destroyed in the process. So that is, uh, that is our concern and that is our question. But um, otherwise we are very, very pleased with the project. <clears throat> Great. Uh, thank you very much for your comment. Um, other, are there any other people who wish to speak? I don't see any other hands. Oh, neither do I. All right. Um, it's an opportunity for you at Wayfinders to respond if you so choose um, to the public comment. Yeah, can I just, if, if we could bring up the illustrative site plan for, for that, uh, for South East Street, I just, I also wanted to help the board understand the abutters property. Uh, so um, if we're looking at this plan, the abutter that just spoke, you know, is all of this. So that's, 
that's their the back of their property. Got it. And so did this and Nate, did the historic commission take a look at this and did they have any did they have any opinion? Did they um did they opine on it at all? Yeah. So the um you know, that's the historic building. And what was asked was about this, this piece right here, which is, you know, allows for a connection into the old building. So, you know, the floor levels may not match. You need to make everything accessible in terms of an elevator. And so uh, the commission did look at that. And so, you know, from the, the important piece from this was how do we maintain some view of the school from the street and how do we also balance an addition? And so we actually require that the, the school building be reused as part of the request for proposal. And when the commission looked at this, they asked, you know, how much can the building in the front be shifted? What could happen? And, you know, what we're seeing here today is, you know, a really nice compromise with a courtyard that can activate the entrance, which is now not used. Uh, you know, they're gonna renovate the school and as was mentioned, probably that, you know, when you first looked at when we when the town first looked at the site, everyone said, wow, this is great. There's this back field. We could put a lot of units in here. Maybe the development would go back there. But essentially, that whole back portion of the property is considered a wetland. So it can't be developed. It, it'll just be mowed and used for passive recreation. It's not heavily programmed, but essentially any development back there can't happen. And so really, to meet the needs of our request for proposal with the number of units, there had to be some addition on the front of this uh, of the school. And so the commission thought this was actually a really nice plan. And so typically with an old building, you'd wanna have as minimal disturbance as you can to an out exterior wall. You often call it a hyphen. So you'd have some connection between a new building and an old building. Uh, and, you know, and that usually is where you'd have circulation, maybe utilities. And so from the commission's perspective, what is shown here is workable because the main entrance is being, uh, you know, rehabilitated. The rest of the perimeter of the building is made, you know, still visible from the exterior and the building is still, still visible from Southeast Street. And so the only condition the commission had on this was, you know, documentation of the building before these changes. So, you know, really nice photographs uh, and any history or anything that could be found about it. But, you know, they thought this was a nice compliment to the building. Um, you know, there, for instance, it could be that, you know, it could have been an addition that covered the whole building, uh, but what what we're seeing is a you know something that works just in one corner, and so you know given the the need for accessibility width of certain you know interior dimensions of things, I'm not sure that that could be made any smaller. So the commission didn't really you know think there was an issue there. Nate, I would uh, like to add one thing to that. If DJ, if you could let me share, I want to point out. I think it's a it's a it's an excellent uh, question, and I want to share the the floor plan here to show what's going on in that zone that you you had just highlighted, Nate. So this is this is where this is a mail room here on the side of this, but this is where the elevator goes. And uh, as as we moved up into the uh, the the um, upper floors, we actually were able to make a connection in the floor above this to use this, the masonry opening that's there. So we are preserving um, the uh, the opening that's on this side so that people will actually walk through one of the openings because of the change of level between the school and the new building. We had to have a small set of stairs going from the lower area to the upper area and people will literally pass through one of those original openings. So we're trying to even uh, preserve what we can on the interior of the building, even though you won't see it uh, from the outside any longer. Okay. All right, last opportunity for um, closing comments, either from the applicant, from Wayfinders. Yeah, or... and I'd just like to- oh, Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I'm Mr. sorry, I'm sorry. I'd just like to speak and, and just thank Angelica for her coming and, and showing her support. And I know that I've you know, had communications with her in the past and it's, it's it, we really appreciate it and and, and um, thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. Gruber. Any other final comments from Wayfinders or any other final questions from um, our board members? If not, 
Um, I just want to review some of the things that I took I, that I've taken notes of that for the next meeting or for future meetings. Some information that we wanted, um, and then pl and please Nate and uh, and Ms. Brestra, uh let's keep a lit running total here and just since I keep a running total of the of the kind of the questions we have. Um, one is uh, we're going to get some um, more information. We're going to talk more about the waiver of the rest. The residential bylaw that'll come later. Um, we're going to ask about. You're going to try to get some average snowfall numbers, or you're going to you're going to give us more information on snowfall and, and work on that. Um, we we answered the filtration basin question. Um, we answered the question about the fence along the drive. Now you're going to give us information on the trash enclosures and perhaps um, shrubbery on the front of the Belgian town site, but the trash, the material, the trash enclosures on the southeast and, and Belgian town site. Um, are there other questions that we have of the board members had for information that we'd like in the future? Okay, I think that's it. All right, um, Mr. Brestrup, I think we've done a pretty good job of explaining the process. Is there anything else we need to add in terms of uh, um, letting the public know about the process for 40B? Did we? Give Not at a... this time. I don't believe you have anything else to say at this time. Great. All right. Um, well, if there's no other questions, I would entertain a motion to continue this hearing on ZBA 2025-04, the public hearing on ZBA 2025-04 to September 19th at 6 p.m. So moved. Is there a second? Second, Mr. Chair. Uh, moved and seconded. Um, any discussion about that? If not, the vote occurs on the motion. The chair votes aye. Mr. Sloboder? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Motion carries. This is continued to, uh, to September 19th. Um, so thank you all, um, Wayfinders, for that really detailed, I think very organized presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. And we look forward to working with you, and, and we'll be seeing a lot of you over the next couple of weeks. Okay. I Thank see you. hands up from both Mr. Malloy and Mr. Gruber. What are we, what are we looking at? Mr. Gruber, what did you want to say? I just wanted to um, just to double check the topics of discussion for uh, next meeting, just so that um, what we anticipate discussing, um, I have a, a, a list of um, architectural and mechanical systems for both Belcher Town Road and the Southeast Street site. And I had sort of a draft list that also mentioned stormwater and stormwater infrastructure design for the Belcher Town Road and Southeast Street site. Are those, is that seem reasonable for the next meeting or should we be prepared for additional or is this something that I can speak with staff with? Um, I think you should be prepared for the architecture, the mechanical systems, and the stormwater systems. I think we do want to see those. We had a lot of talk about the stormwater systems already, so I'm not sure that that would fill up the whole time. And that, if I remember correctly, we have the whole, we have three hours, up to three hours, that we can spend on this on the 19th. Um, I would also talk with staff to see if there's other subjects that can be brought up um, so that we can fill that time most efficiently and move through. We may also want to, by that time, uh, we may want to talk about some peer review, or we may not, but that may come up. So um, I think we should be focusing on the physical stuff for the, at first, and then we'll go into the property management income restrictions, and we can do that later on in September and October. So work with the staff if we, to go be, if we want to go beyond uh, the architectural mechanical systems and the stormwater management. Okay, thank you. Ms. Brestrup, does that make sense? It does. Thank you. Yep. Okay. So I, I just wanted to ask what the continuation was to 7 p.m. Was it? Oh, or, six. Sorry, 6 p.m. 6 p.m. 6 p.m. And then in terms of what we could discuss, um, 
you know, if we have a, the supplemental parking information, we could uh, also discuss that at the next meeting. Yes. Yeah. That'd be good. You can put that on the, on the list. All right. Good. Well, thank you all. We'll see you on the, on the, uh, the, the 19th. Thank you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Uh, we have, we have, um, more items on the agenda. The next item on the agenda is public comment on any matter, not before the board tonight. So the public has an opportunity to comment on anything they wish, except that which we were discussing uh, in the public hearing. So um, Jacinta, Ms. Williams, do we have anybody who's uh, want, has their hand raised? I don't see anybody. Nope. I see nobody. All right. Next order of business is uh, new business stuff not anticipated in the last 48 hours. I think the thing to do would be to go over the, the schedule that we have coming up. Um, and either Ms. Williams or Ms. Brestrup um, just go through the schedule we have. I think you distributed the schedule. We have a, so far we have a meeting on the 12th, the regular ZBA. And what do we have on that um, agenda? Shootsbury for now. What's that? We just have Shootsbury Road for now. We don't have anything else. Right. Okay. Shootsbury Road. Wayfinders again will be the nineteenth. Uh, the twenty-sixth is a regular. Do we have? We don't have. An, we have an agenda for that yet. No. Uh, things have slowed down a bit, so we have a few things out in the ethers, but no one has truly finalized any of their applications. So until people have done their due diligence, they can't really come forward and, and get a date. Okay. So things are a little bit slower for us right now. All right. And on the 10th, I think we had, um, we're coming back with a couple of people are coming back on October 10th. Is that correct? Yes. That mm -hmm. is a red date hey. name, Jonathan Plate. Yeah. Let's continue to the 10th. And then we have the, on the 17th, we have three meetings in October this year, the 10th, the 17th, and the 24th. Wayfinders is one. Okay. I think so what, what the, I have a note that the 10th part of that meeting is Wayfinder also. Is that not true? It's currently scheduled that way, yes. Yeah, okay. Now, okay. you cannot attend. I, I, so I, I, will, I will not be at that meeting. At that meeting. Okay, that's, that's your one. You know, if it's. You can only miss one, right? Yeah. That's it. Yeah. As long as I stay alive, that's the only one I'm missing. <laughs> well, we certainly hope that's the only one you're missing. That's, that's my goal. Right. right. Okay. And, you know, so anyway, that's, that's, you know, a month and a half out. So there may be changes by that time anyway in, in the agenda. Right. All okay. right. Well, I think this went well tonight. I um, do, Anybody have questions on the on the schedule? I just want to get confirmed. firm. So um, Mr. Sloviter is out on the 10th. Chair Judge, you're out on the 24th. And I right. thought, Mr. Henry, you said you were out on a date. Can you remind me what that date was again? I, I think it is the 19th. I'm trying to look at my family calendar. But I think it was September 19th, actually. Okay. Thank you. And just a reminder for you guys, if you do miss a meeting, you view it on the, um, the video and then you just submit a, a disclosure, a notice to the board that you viewed the whole, you've taken the time to view the whole uh, meeting on the, the internet. You read oh, my you, mind. Thank you. <laughs> oh, we, we watch the meeting and then we submit something to whom? To you, chair? I think you can send it to the, the staff. You don't have to send to it Ms. to Ms. Williams. Yep, send it to Ms. Williams. Uh, just an, an email confirming that we've seen it, right? Yep, that's all you have. Yep. And, that's and the make the okay. statement that you feel that you're eligible to vote as a result. Oh, okay. All right. Good. I haven't done this before. I want to make sure I do it right. Thank you. All right. Okay. Any other questions, comments, concerns? We're ending up early tonight, so that's good. Thank you. All right, folks. I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. 
I saw Mr. Meadows say so moved. I can hear him. Second. Can I have a second? I, I, and I hear Mr. Henry as well. So it's moved and seconded. This is not debatable. The chair votes aye. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Sloater. As long as it's not debatable, aye. <laughs> Mr. Henry. Aye. And Mr. Meadows. Aye. Motion is five to nothing. Carries. We are adjourned. Thank you all. Thanks for all your help. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night, everyone.